This video is supported by The Great Courses Plus. SETI, or the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, has access to telescopes all around the world, constantly scanning the skies for signals of alien communication. Processing all this information is a gargantuan task that would require a massive supercomputer that SETI just can't quite afford. So they came up with a pretty brilliant idea. It's called SETI at Home. It's a program you can install on your computer that allows them to use the processing power of your computer in the background while you use it. Spreading that data throughout thousands of computers around the world allows them to process that mountainous amount of data without having to spend a mountainous amount of money on a supercomputer. But back in the 1970s, that was not a possibility. They had to actually go through all that data by hand. Which is exactly what astronomer Jerry Ehrman was doing on August 18th, 1977. He was going through reams upon reams upon reams of data when he ran across a signal that got his attention. It was a massive spike in a particular radio frequency that was 30 times higher than the background noise. It was so noteworthy that he wrote WOW on the page. It's since become known as the WOW signal, and it's still confusing scientists today, 40 years later. Austin Murray asked, can you do a video on the WOW signal? In 1956, on the grounds of Ohio Wesleyan University, construction began on a gigantic telescope the size of three football fields designed to scan the sky for radio signals from deep space. It's officially known as the Ohio State University Radio Observatory because it was actually managed by Ohio State University, but it's become better known by its nickname, the Big Ear. The Big Ear went into operation in 1963 and was originally put to use on the Ohio Sky Survey, which cataloged over 20,000 different sources of radio signals from 1965 to 1971. Since it was on the ground, it basically used the rotation of the Earth to move it across the sky and it would scan the sky along with the rotation. And when it measured a radio signal, they could infer by the time of day and the position of the Earth where in the sky it came from, and then they could match that against visual sky surveys to see if it came from a galaxy or a star or a known pulsar. Now to back up just a little bit, radio waves are just a part of the electromagnetic spectrum. They're the ones with the longest wavelengths and carry the lowest amount of energy. And they're emitted by all kinds of cosmic objects like stars, galaxies, pulsars, quasars, even black holes. And the fact that they're longer wavelengths means that they can more easily pass through debris and space and gas clouds. But the universe is filled with radio waves and they also tend to scatter in our atmosphere. So radio tends to have a very high signal to noise ratio. But back to the big ear, its work on the Ohio Sky Survey got the attention of SETI because they could see the value in a telescope that could be constantly scanning the sky 24 hours a day. So after the Sky Survey was completed, SETI was able to talk Ohio State University into letting them use the big ear, where they started scanning the skies in 1973 and they continued to do so for 22 years. It's actually in the Guinness World Records as the longest continuous extraterrestrial search in history. So as I said in the intro, in the early days, all this stuff got processed by hand. The radio signals were printed on a continuous feed dot matrix printer, and they did it like this. On the right side of the sheet were six columns detailing the coordinates, extension, declination, latitude, longitude, time, and so on. And each row represented 12 seconds of data. On the left side, there were 50 columns representing different channels or frequencies in the radio spectrum. And the numbers descending down from that represented the strength of the signal it was detecting. The numbers go from one to nine, but if they detect a signal stronger than nine, it would actually go up the alphabet. So A was the same as 10, B was the same as 11, and so on. They did this to keep the columns one digit to save space, and it was very rarely used. The vast majority of signals were between one and five. It was a very rare thing for it to go up into the letters. So imagine you're Jerry Ehrman. You're a volunteer for SETI. You're not getting paid to do this, and you're just going through stacks after stacks after stacks of these papers, just swimming in a sea of one and twos. You find some interesting clusters of numbers here and there, the occasional six or seven which you circle because it's not worthy. And then this pops up, 6EQUJ5. Not only letters, but a U? That's 30 times stronger than the background noise. It goes on for 72 seconds total, going in an up and down curve in the same way that a drift scan effect would occur with a telescope passing over a continuous radio signal. In fact, if you graph it out, it looks like this. So Jerry not only circled it, he wrote WOW next to it, and the WOW signal was born. By the way, I want to commend the good sir on his excellent penmanship, very nice. So a popular misconception about the WOW signal is that 6EQUJ5 is actually some kind of alien code that we interpreted, but it's really just a measure of signal strength. Ehrman and many others immediately started pointing telescopes at the area where this signal came from, which was somewhere in the constellation of Sagittarius, but nothing else ever showed up. So it's not a star or a quasar or a pulsar or anything like that because we'd be picking up continuous signals from that location and we've been looking there a long time and it doesn't look like there's anything there. 
at least no cosmic body that would produce a constant stream of radio signals like that. But the mystery actually gets deeper, because it only occurred on one frequency, and that frequency is 1420 megahertz. Now, 1420 megahertz, if you were paying attention to last week's episode on the Voyager mission, is the frequency at which radio comes out of a hydrogen atom when it goes through a hyperfine transition. This is often called the 21 centimeter line or the hydrogen line. That same frequency was used by Carl Sagan and Frank Drake when they created the Pioneer plaques and the Voyager Golden Record as a way to communicate with aliens should they ever come across that spacecraft. And it's actually considered such a strong possibility that an alien species would use that frequency to communicate with us that it's actually been banned for use by international agreement. We have, as an entire planet, agreed to keep this frequency clean just in case. I <laughs> mean, that's amazing. If that signal had been found on any other frequency, it still would have been really interesting, but it was found on this frequency, and only this frequency. So, yeah. Wow. Also, the fact that this frequency is banned eliminates the possibility that it originated from the Earth. But before we go saying it's aliens, we gotta eliminate all the other possibilities. That's how science works. And the first thing to rule out is an astronomical source. So as I mentioned earlier, typically radio signals like this come out of things like pulsars, quasars, and galaxies, but they do it continuously, so if we went back and looked, we would have found something else there, and we didn't. A supernova would have been a one-time burst of energy, but that would have left behind debris clouds and gas that also didn't show up when we examined that area. Another possibility that's been put forth is interstellar scintillation. Scintillation is basically the thing that causes rogue waves in the ocean. The chaotic mixing of millions of random wave patterns coming together in certain areas to create one giant wave. And you can think of space the same way, except instead of water, it's radio waves. But this doesn't explain why other larger radio telescopes like the Very Large Array in New Mexico didn't pick up this same signal. And also in 40 years of radio astronomy, we've never seen anything else quite like it, so... Not to mention that a scintillation would be very unlikely to happen on only one frequency. A new solution that was brought up just this last year was that it might have been a comet. An astronomer named Antonio Paris, how do you get a name like Antonio Paris, published an article in the Journal of the Washington Academy of Sciences that a comet named 266P Christensen may be the culprit. Christensen hadn't been cataloged yet in 1977, so they didn't know that it existed, but according to his calculations, it would have been right about in the place where that signal came from. And as for how a comet could produce radio signals, well, he argued that the frozen hydrogen in the comet would heat up as it approached the sun, and that extra energy could force the hydrogen to release radio waves. Radio waves that would be in that special frequency, because hydrogen. The problem is we've monitored a ton of comets over the years, and we've never seen a radio signal anywhere near that strength, and even Jerry Ehrman himself said that he didn't think that that was the cause. And the last probability is that it's just a computer glitch. And yeah, I mean, that's, that's always a possibility. On the other hand, the big ear ran for 22 years and we never saw another computer glitch that looked anything like that, so pretty fluke occurrence. And also that signal followed the bell curve of a drift scan effect of it passing past a continuous uh, object. So if it was a glitch, it did a really good job of looking like the real thing. The bottom line is to this day, there's been no conclusive solution to this problem and chances are there never will be. I mean, we're talking about trying to figure out what happened over a 72 second span 40 years ago. But what do you think it was? Did I leave anything out? Is there a solution that you've seen out there that you agree with? Do you think it's aliens for sure? Talk about it in the comments. And by the way, what would it mean if it was aliens? What if we really did get some kind of contact from an alien civilization? How would that change us as a society and as a species? That's the subject of a video I just watched in The Great Courses Plus. I've been watching the course Redefining Reality with Dr. Stephen Gimbel, and in one of the episodes he did talk about exoplanets and extraterrestrial civilizations and the possibility of us finding one and what that would mean to us as a society and how that would change our view of reality. It's a fascinating topic. It's one of many fascinating topics that you can find on The Great Courses Plus. The Great Courses Plus is an online learning platform where you can learn from some of the top professors at Ivy League schools across the country and organizations like the Smithsonian Institute and National Geographic. They've got courses on anything really that you can imagine. <laughs> They've got courses on everything from cooking and chess to science and quantum physics and astrophysics. I mean, if you like to get your learn on, The Great Courses Plus is a great place to do it. And if you'd like to check out The Great Courses Plus, they are hooking up all my viewers with a free month if you go to thegreatcoursesplus.com slash answerswithjoe. 
So thanks so much to The Great Courses Plus for sponsoring this video, and I also want to give a quick shout out to the 150 Patreon supporters that are helping support this channel on Patreon. I cannot thank you enough. I want to give a quick shout out to the newest members who joined the tribe. We got Logan Patrick, Charlie Hallam, Dead Rabbit, Yasar Bayado, and Michael Lambert. I think I got all those right. If you would like to join them, get some sweet, sweet perks, you can go to patreon.com slash answers with Joe. Like and share if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, welcome. Thank you so much for watching. And maybe check out some of my other videos. You might like those too. And maybe consider subscribing so you can catch other videos on similar topics to this. All right. Thanks so much for watching. You guys go out there and have an eye-opening week, and I will see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.